All right, if you'll open up your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. Are y'all glad to be here this morning? Amen. Amen. Are you glad to be with each other this morning? Amen. All right, that's even louder than the first one. That was great. All right, when you get there to Ezekiel 34, please stand. We'll read verses 1 through 10. So then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and you clothe you with wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was to say which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. They and they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill, yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I pray that your word touches people this morning. Lord, that you anoint my lips, my, my tongue, and Lord, that the words that come out of my mouth are not my own. But Lord, that... that that you would anoint the, the hearts and the minds and the ears that everyone here can hear from you and not from me. And Lord, we just we thank you most of all for your son. We can't thank you enough. Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so I'm going to start out with a, with a disclaimer. Uh, my family has already heard this because I preached this uh, Friday at our worship service at POS. But uh, now I was speaking to a bunch of preachers and a bunch of preachers in training and a bunch of retired preachers and teachers and what have you. But the same message applies. And so I'm going to start out by going to the book of Hosea in chapter 4. It says in verse 2, By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out or break their bonds, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Does this sound like the world we see? If you've watched the news, that should sound familiar about the lawlessness that we have in this country. And so when you have an, a situation like that, those are symptoms of missing something, okay? There are a lot of times when people get sick, they, they show symptoms of missing a vitamin. You know, I, I've heard of people that didn't have energy, so they go get a B12 shot, and it helps them. There's something missing there. And in Hosea chapter 4, it's in verse 1, it says, For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. And verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. There is not a knowledge of God in the land. And a pastor, a preacher that I listen to a lot, he's an African-American preacher in Dallas. His name is Tony Evans. And he said it this way, and he was talking about racial problems. But he said it this way, and racial problems are a symptom of no knowledge of God in the land. But he said racial prop problems have gone on since America's inception because their root has not been addressed by the people who are most qualified to address it. 
Who are those people? The church. Those are the people most qualified to address the sin problems in this country. That would be us. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment begins here with us. We look at, and we're talking about shepherds here in Ezekiel. And Jesus told Peter, he said, Feed my sheep. And in turn, Peter, addressing some of the scattered Jews, he, he was addressing the elders of that community in 1 Peter 5, 2. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof. In Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33, he's commissioned as a watchman. And he says, if, if, the, if the enemy comes and you do not blow the trumpet, I will require their blood on you. Their blood is upon you. Meaning, if we know the enemy is coming, we know the dangers that that's living in a life of sin presents to people, and we don't warn them. We don't warn them about what it means to live without Jesus Christ and, and the troubles and the punishment that goes along with that. It's on us. The church has not been a good watchman. The church has not been good shepherd. You know, and, and this is not just talking about the pastors. This is just not talking about the preachers. It's not just talking about the elders or the leaders in the church. I've told you all this before. If you're a blood-bought, born-again Christian, you are a shepherd to somebody in your life. There are people that look to you for spiritual guidance, whether you like it or not, whether you want them to look to you for, for uh, mentorship. When you look in the New Testament, when Paul's writing to Timothy and he's writing to Titus, and he talks to the old women, he talks to the old men, what does he tell them? He says, help train the young women. Help train the young men. You know, he tells P Timothy, don't let them despise you by your youth. You know, the kids, the adults, the older generation, everybody here are shepherds of somebody. And it's serious. A lot of people don't want to don't want to do that. They don't want the responsibility. But we got if we believe what Peter writes about being a priesthood of all believers, we are all in this priesthood. Now, in, in the world today and in the church, we kind of uh, uh, differentiate between ordained people and lay people. But the thing is, we all have a responsibility as Christians. And it's not easy, it's serious, and we ought to take it serious. We ought to take our relationship with God serious. We ought to take how we serve God seriously. And the church has not done it. You know, when we sing that song, I've decided to follow Jesus, do we think about what that means? It says, no turning back. You know, we got to be aware of the responsibility, what it means to follow Jesus, even unto death. Jesus Christ showed us the example by dying. And we're too worried about living in the world. You know, I had a, uh, a guy that I worked with. He was an older gentleman. He was in his 60s. Always wanted to be promoted. Always wanted to go from Lab Tech 1 to Lab Tech 2. And his work ethic just didn't fit the bill. He didn't work hard. But he complained enough. Squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? He complained enough. And, he, and my boss stuck his neck out and promoted him. But he told him, he said, with this promotion, I'm going to require more out of you. You're going to have to show some more responsibility. You're going to have to show some more initiative. We're gonna, there's going to be guys depending on you. You know what he did the next week? He retired. He come in, he said, how many days notice do I got, do I got to give, give to retire? They said, two days. This was a Thursday. He said, this Thursday and Friday, that's my notice. Because he did not want that responsibility. He didn't want the responsibility that came with the title. And so, you know, as things are crumbling around us and we look for blame, what is causing this situation in the world? Why are things the way they are? We look at the world and... and, and a lot of times we say, they took God out of our schools. They took God out of our workplace. Now, that's fine. 
You know, that, that is different than what it used to be. But if our children are born again and they walk into the school, God walks in with them. If we walk into a workplace and we're indwelled with the Holy Spirit, God walks in with us. You know, so if anybody took God out of the schools, it's the church. It's us because we have failed in what we do. It's like Nathan said to David when he tells David the parable about the man that, that, that killed his neighbor's sheep. And Nathan looks at David and he says, Thou art the man. You are the one at fault. You are the reason. We are the church. We are a lot of the reason why this world is the way it is today. So when we look at verses 2 and 3 in Ezekiel chapter 34, he says, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flock. So we look at the shepherds as the church. Now there's a lot of Old Testament scriptures, especially in the major prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, that talk about punishment and judgment to the shepherds and leaders of Israel because they let the people go astray, because they didn't take their job seriously. And so what I, Ezekiel is talking about here is how basically the shepherds have fattened themselves up and left the sheep to themselves. You know, so while the church is get, sitting in the shade getting fat, we're letting other people starve. We're letting other people uh, do without and live without Jesus Christ in their lives and not seeing that influence. I had a, I had a professor that told me this week, she said if the church would tithe, Everybody that goes to church, if they would give 10%, if they would tithe, world hunger would end. And that's a, that's a noble premise. That's a noble concept. But the problem is it wouldn't happen. If, if everybody gave 10%, world hunger would not end because we'd build bigger buildings, we'd give our preachers raises, we'd find somebody else to pay and put on staff. That's what churches do. You know, if, if this church here, if everybody that walked through these doors gave 10%, how would we, what would we do to help people? What would we do to end hunger? What would we do to, let, to bring people to Jesus Christ? What would we do? You know, because we see the model of most churches in this society... We have become practicers of what's called temple theology. What that means is our church revolves around our building. And that's not the case. You know, I spoke a few weeks back. Nowhere in the Bible does the word church refer to a building. Everything we do, for the most part, most churches centers around the building that they are housed in. When the church is the people. And we have failed at that. That, that's, we're letting that drive what we do. And so if we are to model ourselves after Jesus, John 10 calls him the good shepherd. Psalm 103 says we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So we are to model ourselves after Jesus. That means we should put others before us. In the book of Philippians, verses, in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, It says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not to every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That, mean we, that means we are to put other people before us, before our wants, before our needs. We are to put other people in front of us. Are y'all getting this? Is it making sense? John chapter 4. Okay, Jesus sees the Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, he tells her about the living water. She goes into town. She said, come out, come out and meet this man who told me everything that I'd ever done. Everything about my life. And many there in Samaria believed. So after Jesus fed them spiritually, the disciples come to him and said, Master, you need to eat. You need some bread. Jesus said, I don't need it. 
They said, well, did you eat anything? He said, no, I've got bread. I've got meat that you don't know about. He was seeing to other people's needs before he fed himself. John chapter 6, when he fed the 5,000, does it record him eating? He broke the bread. He had the apostles pass it out. It doesn't record him eating. He's making sure other people got fed before himself. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, did he eat? No. He fed everybody else. So when we look in Ezekiel 34, and we read verse 4, it says, The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. So in Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes to the temple. He stands up and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. And what he does, he says that he came to do everything that the shepherds of Israel wasn't doing. Where they had failed, Jesus came and he said in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That responsibility, when Jesus ascended to be on the right hand of God with the Father, Who's that responsibility go to? The church. Us. But yet when we look in Ezekiel, in verse 5 it says, They were scattered because there is no shepherd. Now, Ezekiel just said that there were shepherds in Israel. But it said there is no shepherd. It's just like there is no shepherd. It, 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 it would have been just the same if there wasn't shepherds in Israel. And at times when you look at this world, it's just the same as if there was no church. What are we doing? Verse 6 says, My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Luke 19.10, Jesus says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So we, we look at as being shepherds in the church. I'm just, not just the pastors, not just the elders. If you are saved, if you name the name of Jesus Christ, you are part of the church, you are the shepherds. And, 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 it's, and he shows us what are, we are to be doing. Healing the brokenhearted, binding up at which is wounded, feeding the poor, healing the sick. Not just praying for them, healing them. And seeking that which was lost. And you can't do one without the other. This is not just feeding them and not telling them why. We've got to let people know why we do these things. Book of Colossians 3.17 says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Everything we do, we do it for God. Effort. So I talked to our Sunday school class this morning. Do it as you're doing it to God. But too many times in the church, we go through the motions because we're just trying to get through another worship service. We're just trying to get through Sunday school. We're just trying to get through Bible study. And we don't put the effort that's required. And that's what the people in Ezekiel's day in talking about the shepherds, they didn't put in the effort. And they didn't care. Do we care that people are dying every day and going to hell? Do we care that people are starving? Do we care that people don't have clothes? And so in, in our inward focus, we turn, let the people outside of the church, we've left them to the wolves. That's what it says in verse 8, My flock became a prey. My flock became meat to every beast of the field. 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We've heard that verse. We know it. But it says, Be sober and be vigilant. Be on the guard. Be awake. Look, if a shepherd's watching the sheep, if he falls asleep at night, what happens? 
coyotes, wolves, whatever predator that stalks at night comes and they eat the sheep. And we have fallen asleep. We're not sober. Being sober, being aware. That's what when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he talked to James, Peter, and John. He said, look, stay awake. Watch with me. Be strong. I know, I know you want to, but the flesh is weak. You've got to overcome it. Be strong and be awake. Watch with me. But as the church, every, the majority of churches, we've fallen asleep. You know, we occupy our time with different things and we forget the focus. We fill our days with programs and, and such, and, and we, don't, we don't remember that worship is what happens outside of here. We meet to come together to fellowship with one another to build each other up. But we lose sight of when Jesus told the woman at the well that the day will come and now is when you will worship God in spirit and in truth. That's just not talking about Sunday mornings. That's talking about every day of your life. And so as a church, we've kind of kept to ourselves a lot of times. You know, I got to thinking about it. Used to, the churches, they had stained glass windows because they told a story. A lot of people were illiterate. They couldn't read the Bible. They didn't have one at home to read, so the stained glass windows told stories. You would have images and scenes from the Bible to explain to the common people, to the common folk that couldn't read. Now the only purpose they serve is it keeps us from looking outside. It keeps us from being distracted by the outside world. You know, we sit in here with the stained glass windows, maybe it keeps us from being distracted by who's driving to the cemetery or the dogs running around outside. We can't see what's going on. We can't see where the church has to be in the world. They have to give that witness. You know, are we, are we numb our minds with technology? You know, spend all our time on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I know some of y'all don't understand what that is, but there's some of you that do. Some of us all too well. And I heard a preacher say this, and it makes sense. Okay, and there's good things that happen with technology. I can open up my Bible, or my phone, and I have a hundred different translations of the Bible. I've got all the... Uh, knowledge that's been contained in encyclopedias throughout all time, I have access to it. But I heard a preacher say, if the Apostle Paul or the original 12, if they had phones and they stayed on them as much as we do, would, we get, would they have gotten anything done? You know, and that's what this world has come into, and it's too prevalent in the church. But the good thing is, so I give all the bad news, you want to hear the good news, right? When you go into a place and somebody diagnoses you with an illness, okay, Doc, what's the good news? What can I do to get better? And I hadn't heard the sermon, but I think Tony preached on it last week. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, that's the church, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. So what's that saying the church needs to do? Everything contained in that verse says the church needs to be repenting. The people inside the church need to be repenting for, for letting their guard down, not doing what God has called us to do for not loving people like we should, for not preaching the gospel like we should, by not just being good Christians, Christ followers. Had a, many of you may be familiar with Perrin Rice. He bragged on me a little bit when I seen him. He teaches the preaching class there. He said, Dennis, you're a strong preacher. He said, we've got to have those. He says, if the church is going to be what it needs to be, we've got to have those. But it's not just the preachers. It's every one of us. Look, I could stand up here and I could preach the best sermon you've ever heard. Unless you listen, it, it doesn't matter. You know, if we don't let the Word of God affect us. You know, I always go back, and this is one of my favorite illustrations, is the fact 
that God tells John in the book of Revelation, he tells Ezekiel in the book of Ezekiel, to swallow the scroll. Eat it. Let my word become a part of you. You know, we, we used to aggravate kids, and you know, you are what you eat. And we tell them, that you'll, you eat so many, so much pizza, you're going to turn into a pizza. Let's digest God's word to where we turn into a shining, glorious reflection of Jesus Christ. That we go out and we practice that more than just faith. More than just saying we believe in Jesus. But when people see us, they know. So that comes down to who can help fix this mess that the world is in. And as David was told by Nathan, thou art the man. We are the people. We are the people that have the power to fix what's going on. Somebody, some people might say, well, only God can fix this. Only the Holy Spirit can fix this. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Where does he dwell? Right here. He dwells right here. So I'm going to finish up as Cheryl and Cleet come up. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and the witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Being good shepherds to the flock. We've got to be willing, we've got to be honest, we've got to be humble, eager, loving examples, even all the way to the cross. That's what Peter lists out right there those attributes and uh, I had a preacher earlier this week that was preaching to us and he said no cross no crown when we look at the example of Jesus and the main example is that he went all the way to the cross for us Paul says I die daily John chapter 10 says a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Has the church been doing that? Has Christians, people that name the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, have they been doing it? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that everybody here has been touched and has heard what you have to say. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that needs to repent, Lord, that they come to the altar. And Lord, as, as we are supposed to be examples to the, to the flock, maybe people see them repent and know, hey, maybe I need to repent too. Because God, we have let not only each other down, but we've let you down. I pray that your anointing would be on everybody here. And if somebody is here that doesn't know you, or if somebody's here that strayed away from you, Lord, I pray that you would convict them. And Lord, they would make it right. Lord, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.